this talented artist was having a little trouble drawing the face of their character. We've all been there, my friend. I'll do my best to help you out. First, I'm going to draw the shape of the head. There's no real trick to it. It's just practice, really. I'm going to draw a horizontal line at about the halfway point of the head to indicate where his eyes will go. And then a vertical line to help me see where his nose will be. The circles are going to represent the entire eyeball and the entire tip of the nose. Then I'm going to add the eyebrows above the eyeballs. And then following the shape of the eyeball, I'm going to draw the eyelids, the iris, and then the underneath of the eye. I give him a bit of a longer nose to give him some personality. And I'm just adding some shading on one side. Also, I'm adding a little bit more shading around the eyes because your brows do cast a shadow. And when drawing lips, remember, men have lips too. So draw an upper and a lower lip. Let's give him some well-defined cheekbones, a nice jawline. And I've done a few tutorials on drawing the eyes, nose, mouth, and even eyebrows. And you can watch them all in the Art Hacks playlist in my bio. I think you're on the right path. Your initial drawing was fantastic, and I hope this helps. The best tip I learned when it comes to eyes is start with a circle. Since the eye is a sphere, I always start with that. Then overlap the eye with the skin above it, the upper and lower eyelid. Now you can see the shape of the eye underneath the skin and how it affects the light and shadows around it. And always remember, the eyelid will cast a shadow on the eye as well. Now for a side view, you're still going to start with a sphere. The lashes are more prominent here, and you can see how the eyelid follows the shape of the eye much clearer here. Once you've got that mastered, the placement of the eyelids then gives you your expressions. When the eyelids don't touch the iris, you get a shocked or startled look. And when the eyelids cover most of the eye, you get a sneaky or cynical or just plain tired look. And not all eyes look the same. Eastern Asian eyes have a wonderful almond shape and an epicanthal fold that has no distinct eyelid crease. Oh, another tip. When drawing eyelashes, don't try to draw each individual eyelash. Just make a shape. Keep it simple. Another great thing to practice is lighting. The eye is a sphere. Light will hit one side and shadow on the other side. On the iris, the center colored part, remember that if the highlight hits one side of the iris, shade it darker around that highlight. But the opposite side of the iris will be a bit lighter. I hope this helps. And remember, no tip or trick or hack will improve your art more than practice. Eyebrows are where we get our expression, our personality. It's our visual indicators from person to person as to what we're thinking or feeling. While there's all different types of eyebrows, thick, thin, bushy, well-trimmed, they all serve the same purpose, to tell one another how we feel. So what you're really looking for is expressions, and I can't think of a better way to practice drawing expressions than to copy Calvin and Hobbes. So try this little exercise, taking a cartoon character expression and making it more realistic. It'll help you push yourself and your expressions to a whole new level, and it's really fun. Drawing eyebrows are simple enough, but capturing the right expression, that's tough. That's really tough. And so it takes a lot of practice and observation. So that's my recommendation. Grab your favorite comic strip, copy them, Draw them in your style and have fun. Have you ever drawn an eye that you like so much you decide you need to draw the second eye to match it? But then you go to draw the second eye and it starts out okay until you realize you just drew sloth from the Goonies. Okay, so obviously the best thing to do is to prepare for both eyes before you draw them. Find your center marks and doodle away. Of course, when we're doodling, we usually don't plan these things out. So let's say you drew an eye without planning it out. What can you do? I would get a piece of tracing paper. Trace your lines only. You don't need the shading. We just want the shapes. Then flip over the tracing paper, rub a little graphite pencil over it, and then use a ballpoint pen to transfer the graphite onto the paper. And now you have an identical second eye. Easy peasy. As always, I highly recommend planning ahead first. But if you don't, try the tracing technique. Remember, tracing isn't cheating. It's just a tool artists use to save us in our time of need. Kind of like a superhero. I get asked for drawing tips on a daily basis, and it's always fun to try and simplify things to make it easier to learn to draw. For noses, I start off with a circle. It's the general shape of the nose. Then I put these little parentheses on each side. Next, the nostrils. Make sure they connect only in the middle, never touching the parentheses on the side. For the side view, same thing. Circle, but with only one parentheses. And the nostrils again, don't connect to it, only the circle. For the three quarters view, make sure you emphasize only the farther side of the circle as it overlaps the farther parentheses. Once you've gotten that, it's just a matter of practicing various nose shapes. There's upturned noses and downturned noses, narrow noses and wide noses, but it all starts with a simple circle and a couple of parentheses. Now, full disclosure, I'm an art major, so I'm pretty sure that parenthesis is not the medical term for these thingies on the side of the nose, but just go with it, okay? For me, when drawing mouths, the most important thing is that line, just that middle line. Focus on the opening, and from there, everything else will fall into place. Everybody's mouth is different. There's so many different shapes, but if you can get the opening right, that's where you're gonna get the expressions. That's where you're gonna get the personality. So focus on that, practice that first. Then from there, you can add the upper and lower lip. That's when everything takes shape. Even on the profile, add the line where the mouth opens, 
then the upper lip and the lower lip. Remember that they're gonna be affected by light and shadow, with the upper lip almost always being darker than the lower lip. Giving the lower lip some bounce light from underneath also helps give it the illusion of volume. Now when it comes to teeth, I try not to draw the gums and every tooth in full detail. I know that's what you see in real life, but it can be very distracting. So I try to simplify it. Just give a hint of teeth, a subtle little bit of shading for the gums. Let people's mind do the rest. And remember, lips come in all shapes and sizes, so practice drawing every kind you can find. Full lips, thin lips, wide lips, narrow lips, pursed lips, chapped lips, pierced lips, and fuzzy lips. There's so many shapes, colors, and sizes, you have a lifetime of practice ahead of you. Ears are just weird looking, okay? They're just kind of weird. No matter how many times I draw them, they always look alien to me. But weird or not, they are kind of fun to draw, once you get the basic shapes down. The main one being this rounded piece on the top. It's kind of like a little umbrella or awning folding over the inner part of the ear. It's gonna create a shadow, so that's really what I want you to focus on is where you're gonna see the shadows. So here's the three spots with the most contrast. These are the main things to focus on. The hole where the ear canal is, the upper part we just spoke about, and the bottom of the earlobe. And speaking of earlobes, some have ears that have attached earlobes, and others have kind of droopy earlobes, like this. Other than that, I just kind of focus on those three parts and then fill the rest of the ear with some lines and shade it in. I know it's not very scientific, but you all did ask me how I draw ears, and this is it. For better or worse, ears are weird, and I guess, so am I. Hair is quite possibly my favorite thing to draw. I, I just love doing it. But you gotta have the right tools. I use the zebra brush pens. They give me great control of line. I can go thick, I can go thin, it's wonderful. So the harder you push down, the thicker the line is, and the lighter you push, the thinner the line is. So my biggest recommendation for doing hair is think of them as ribbons. They bend, they flow, they curl, just like a ribbon, like, a, like on a Christmas present. You'll see me using my brush pen to kind of feather. You'll see the little lines. That kind of gives you the impression of hair. And I'm leaving out the little spot where the highlights are. So the darker spots where there's more color and the lighter spots where there's gonna be more highlight. It takes some practice and it's a bit time consuming, but if you keep adding ribbon after ribbon, line after line, you'll start to see it come together. And with a little bit of practice, it can look like this, or this, or this or this. Just stick with it and have fun. And please make sure to tag me in your new uh, piece. I'd love to see it. I'm by no means an expert, but here's how I draw Afro textured hair. For very short hair, you're gonna do a stippling effect like this. You could probably even use a dotted line for the hairline as well. For medium length hair, I'd like to do a variation of thick to thin lines. If you're using a brush pen like I am, you could push down harder for thicker lines and press softer for thinner lines. For longer man's hair, I usually focus on the overall shape and just focus on the highlights. For women's hair, there's an unlimited amount of styles. Amanda Gorman's hair is amazing, but I focused on the bun here for this sample. Feathering out from the middle, going thicker lines to thin lines. For an afro, you're gonna use longer, thinner, curlier lines. You usually start the part from the top then running the line all the way down. Now for braids and dreads it's a similar technique. You're going to be using longer lines as well but you can vary your pressure to give the illusion of thickness. And remember you're not trying to draw every strand of hair, you're giving the illusion of that, your interpretation. And finally probably my favorite, curls. For this technique I push down hard and lift up in a circular fashion, then again in a 45 degree angle, and then just repeat it over and over and over and over again. There's so many more styles you can draw as well. I highly encourage you to look them up, experiment, and have fun. Want to learn a simple way to draw hair? Come study the master illustrator, J.C. Leyendecker, with me. J.C. Leyendecker would simplify hair into shapes, much in the way that a sculptor would, turning them into graphical images. Being that this was in the 1920s, the hairstyles had a lot of curls as well, too. This, of course, gave him great shapes to work with. Sometimes he'd work with smaller shapes, sometimes larger shapes. But it's a great exercise, and I definitely recommend trying it. No single strands of hair, just decorative shapes that artfully frame the face. His men's hair is so simple it could be a plastic cap put on top not wasting any time with single strands of hair. He's just looking at the overall shape. And sometimes it gets really, really simple like this one. I mean, look at this. But for the most part, he's playing around with wonderful little curls, and I just love it. Over the years of studying J.C. Leyendecker's work, some of it seeped into my own art. I actually find myself unconsciously grouping hair into artistic shapes. Isn't it amazing how studying someone else's work can influence your own? So you want to learn how to draw the human head at different angles. Side view, three quarters view, or whatever this is. <laughs> I don't really have a hack or anything that can instantly help you. What I do every time is draw from reference. I mean, can I draw from my mind? Sure, 
but it's so much better when I use photos. And you should too. It's how you learn. It's how we all learn. Let's look at a profile picture. Copy it together. Profiles are kind of hard because they can look flat if you do it 100%. I like to have it be just a bit off so you can see a little of the other eye. And three quarters is best. You can see cheekbones and jawline and everything. Definitely prefer this. There's a ton of great teachers who will show you all the parts of the skull and the muscles and just really help you learn anatomy. And they could do it so much better than me because I mostly slept through those classes. Me, when I draw something, I look at a photo. That's the best advice I could give you. I can draw most anything if I can see it. Do so you want to get better at drawing heads from different angles? Look up some photos. Have your friends or family pose for pictures. Copy it. Learn from it. Draw every day through repetition and observation and practice you'll improve. And no amount of tips, tricks, or hacks will help you as much as just looking and drawing what you see. I promise. Look, I'm gonna be real honest with you. I hate drawing hands, and I'm really bad at it. I mean, look at my paintings. See any hands here? No, and that's because I'm so bad at them. And when I do paint hands, I put gloves on them. It's cheating, I know, but let's just figure this out together, okay? I start off with a trapezoid shape for the hand. Then I add the four knuckles, just circles. It's never in a straight line, always rounded. From there, just make some cylinders. Usually, I just do two, coming out for the fingers. The best advice, though, is to practice. If you have an extra hand, draw it. Sometimes I use action figures, or you can just Google pictures. But with any drawing, practice is what's gonna help you more than shortcuts. Look at how much I improved on this page from the first hand drawing to the last. Okay, maybe not this last one. I have no idea what's going on here. But I got some good ones in there, right? The point is, you'll get better with practice. And we can all use some practice. Especially when it comes to hands. I hate hands. I've been asked a bazillion times to do a tutorial on legs. So, here you go. I usually start off with cylinders, larger at the top and smaller at the bottom, like this. I make two, one for the thigh area, which is larger, and one for the shin area, which is smaller, and a circle for the knee. Now in general, this makes sense and it works, but after playing around a bit, I knew I needed some help explaining this. So I went to the bookshelf to grab a copy of Bridgman's Constructive Anatomy. This is the book I turn to when I need help with human anatomy. It's really well done, easy to read, and great art. As artists, we can't remember every lesson we've ever learned, and we're absolutely not expected to be experts at everything art. So don't be afraid to open up a book, trace someone else's art, and learn from them. By simply tracing over these drawings, I remembered something I'd long forgotten. The leg muscles have counterbalances. The muscles are angled opposites of each other, like this. So now when you simplify your shapes, you can draw them more like this. See? I think that looks much closer to how legs work. I hope this helps. I'll leave a link to Bridgman's book in my art supply list in my bio. Again, I'm not a teacher, just a fellow student of art, learning right alongside you. Start off with a square piece of fabric, then draw a point in the middle. Now hang the fabric from that point to get an idea of where the folds are coming from. You can play around with additional points. Imagine how gravity will pull the cloth down from those points. See how the cloth will fold in on itself. It's a fun exercise. That's one way of learning. Another way is copying a master. Let's take a look at one of my favorite artists, J.C. Liondecker. Now this man can paint folds. First, let's spot where the cloth is going to be hanging from. This seam at the shoulder. See how the cloth pulls away from that seam, going out in a triangular shape? Here on Uncle Sam, it's not a seam, but bunching from a sitting position. Notice the zigzagging as it folds in on itself. Longer pieces of fabric, like dresses or coats, will have longer lines. But there's always a place where they're going to bunch, where the draping comes from. That's the fun part to draw. So when drawing cloth, look for where it's being pulled. It could be a seam, a hand grasping the cloth, an elbow, anything. And lots of times, there's multiple points. Just look for those points of tension. And remember, the cloth is going to drape away from there. As always, the best way to get good at this, or anything, is practice. Bring a sketchbook with you. Draw people out in the wild. Copy fashion magazines. Study the masters. Whatever you can do. But just keep drawing, and you'll get it. I promise. I get asked every day to do a video about proportions, foreshortening, and dynamic posing. <laughs> I always say, go pick up a copy of How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. It's so good. John Buscema breaks down both normal human and superhuman proportions. Men, women, good guys, and bad guys. It's easy to understand, and the visuals are immaculate. He breaks down foreshortening, which is how artists show perspective with the human form. The way we give the illusion of body parts being closer to the viewer by making them larger. And as you learn more about foreshortening, you can move on to... Chapter 6. Want your characters to have cool poses? Feel like they're more alive? Then copy, trace, and study Chapter 6. That's where proportions and foreshortening all come together to get you really dynamic figures. It's so fun to draw. Oh, and on top of this book, I would spend hours and hours copying poses from my favorite cartoons. Dragon Ball Z was always great for that. I have hundreds of pages of sketchbooks filled with tiny little gesture drawings from when I was a kid. And that's how we learn, isn't it? By drawing over and over and over. Training our hands and eyes to work together. To see the body proportions, foreshortening, and body language. It all comes down to practice. 
practice, and a good foundation, like how to draw comics the Marvel way. If you want your pencil drawings to be more realistic, you need three things, good photo reference, daily practice, and the right tools. Get yourself a B or softer pencil, both a regular and needed eraser, a mini electric eraser if you want to get fancy, and most importantly, a blending stick. So for photo reference, let's start with this amazing cosplay of Siri by Narga Aoki. I'm going to block out the shapes quickly, then once I'm happy with the proportions, I'll fill in the details a bit. Then I could start adding some shading, just lightly now with the pencil. Once I've got enough coverage, I can use the blending stick to smooth out the pencil lines. This will give it a more realistic look. You don't want to see the pencil lines, so the blending stick smudges the pencils to give it a soft blurry feel. The biggest thing about going realistic is that you're working with values, not lines. The difference is between light and dark. So use the blending stick and erasers to capture the darks and the lights as you see them in the photo. I'm only 20 minutes in here, but you get the idea. Now compare it to my normal style. See how I'm looking at line and color instead of value and tone? Whatever style you choose, you're going to get better with practice. So don't get discouraged and practice your drawing every day. You'll see improvements, I promise. And that's it. I hope it helped. And if you'd like me to make more of these compilations, just let me know. Leave a comment and have a wonderful day.